everybody. We're going to kick things off. I'm going to open up remarks, and we have a bunch of amazing panels today. Um, I'm going to talk about how do you build an enduring startup in the age of AI, and especially in an AI native world. And the thing that we think about, especially in investment spaces, do you actually have a moat? So I have a question for you. Um, this is a poll for the room. Get ready. I'm going to ask you some questions. Most of you work at startups on how long does your technical moat? Now, I know there's some people that are not quite familiar with what a moat is. Um, a moat is your defensive strategy, right? For example, um, in the past, people, startup founders would say their moat could last for many years because they had unique IP that nobody else had. But in the age of AI, things are moving so fast, it's in a different way. So that your moat is your defense against other startups or other large corporations or even like large AI companies like OpenAI or Anthropic. Okay? So get ready. Did you bring your hands? I want to see. Raise your hand if you have a hand. Okay. The guys in the back don't have their hands today, but I just want to make sure that we're all here. So it, does your technical moat, does it last? Raise your hand. I'm going to switch mics. Test. Okay. So raise your hand if your technical moat is decades long. Oh my gosh. Okay. One hand. Uh, how about years? No hand. One hand. How about quarters? Five hands. How about months? Okay. That's about 10 hands. And how about weeks? Two, three hands. They're being honest. And how about days? Okay. One hand. I don't know if you're, I'm not sure if he's joking. All right, that could be a, a, a GPT rapper, right? Like, so, so I think the, the finding here is there was a, definitely a spread, but I saw definitely some heat on the months. And I recently did this poll at another AI conference, and the average attendee said their technical moat is months. That's not very long. So how do we actually extend that? How do you build an enduring AI strategy? And I'm here to share with you a number of uh, ways that you can do those. So I'm a general partner. I lead the AI investments at Blitzscaling Ventures. Who's heard of the book called Blitzscaling? OK, over half the room. So Blitzscaling was a Stanford class taught by Reid Hoffman and Chris Yeh and others that interviewed the AI, I'm oh, sorry, no, the CEOs of all the tech winners in dot-com, web two, and the sharing economy to find out how do you win. And it became a book, best-selling book, which was published several years ago, which became a VC firm, and I'm one of the partners. And thank you. I, am, I have a background in enterprise, forestry analyst, Tadachi, and uh, had some of my own startups as well. And really what I am known for is my passion for leading ecosystem and community. So this is actually an, this is actually one moat, is ecosystem, right? That's a network effect. And this is what STEP is, right? And so this is an event I started two years ago. How many have ever been to Llama Lounge? OK, about a third of the room. So I started this event. It was in a small pizza shop. Bill has been there, actually, uh, down on Market in Ninth. And people started pulling out their laptops and demoing their AI startups. That was two years ago. And I kept on growing it. There's a submission form, and it's, we have larger hosts. And here's a recent event. It's just expanded a little bit. So this continues to grow. And usually, it's AI founders. That's really the only group we let in, in addition to VCs and corporate AI buyers who partner with them. So the talent strategy, I've definitely seen this shift over the years. So in the dot-com wave, I saw that companies would brag about um, how many employees they have. In fact, when you meet somebody from corporate, one of the things they brag about, if they're middle management or execs, is how many reports they have, right? Um, in the social media wave, uh, those companies, the large, like Facebook and Twitter, they would hire many employees to become scalable, right? It's about hiring humans. And then the sharing economy, like Airbnb and Uber, we saw a shift where they didn't want to hire as many employees. Instead, they wanted to have independent contractors. They wanted the Uber drivers not to be employees, uh, but to do the work for them. They don't want to have the W-2 employees for Airbnb. Those are independent partners, right? So we saw this shift. But now in this world, the AI world, we're seeing even a different shift where instead of hiring humans at all, 
the AI founders, especially here in San Francisco, are using AI agents. So that is a significant change. And there's been numerous reports on how entry-level workers are struggling to find jobs, even if you have a software engineering degree or computer science degree. All right, so this leads us to what we see as this future. This is our thesis on AI agents. Right now, most humans are traversing the web, whether it's the public internet or enterprise apps, to get information or fulfill or to complete tasks. And in the future, that's going to change where the AI agent is going to complete that task on your behalf. So you do not need to go to very many websites. You don't have to open all these different apps. So I have a question then for the room. In this world, how many apps do you actually need? One? Five? Yeah, it's a debate we can have over break. Um, I, my answer is you'll have as many AI agent primary apps as you currently do email accounts you manage. That's how what I think the answer is. And so a personal one, career one, maybe one with your family, and your employer will issue a primary AI agent you'll interface with. I don't think you'll just have one. I think that'd be very rare. Now, secondly, the second part of the thesis is the AI agents will bring all of that information back to you, even if you're B2B enterprise. Like, it'll fill out your expense reports, bring that information back for you, or fill out your reports, it'll do it for you, and reassemble the information in the way that you want. Do you like text or video, audio? Do you want a lot of information, a little? Or do you want it in the morning, noon, or evening? You choose, you get the information you want in the interface that you want. This completely unravels the internet as we know it. So. These AI agents, and it's important we have this foundation, are going to change the way you run your startup or your business if you're a large company. AI agents, by the definition, we interviewed founders that are working on these projects. They are software, and sometimes hardware, that can sense the world around them. They complete tasks. They learn on their own, and they can actually recruit other AI agents around them. For example, in your home, you will eventually have an AI agent that will make sure you have all of the meals lined up for the entire family for that week. It'll also have an AI agent to manage your emails, filtering, um, doing low-level responses, and we know that there's tools like that that are starting to do that. And then at work, maybe it's going to gather all the information for you and do real-time or monthly reports. You don't have to go find those data sources. It'll do it for you or fill out those annoying expense reports. And then in the physical world, here in San Francisco, we see self-driving cars, Waymos, Zooks, and whatever comes next. Those are AI agents. Self-driving cars are the physical manifestation of an AI agent. Now, at the more advanced space is your agents will orchestrate other agents as well. It'll recruit agents, hire agents, summon agents, or dynamically create agents called execution agents to complete those tasks. So that's the future that we see that's going to happen. This is some forecasting from Crew AI on the growth. Essentially, we're going to see 10 times growth in the agent space. This is focused on enterprise, consumer, probably will have a similar growth chart, 10x every five years. That might be conservative, uh, but this is an area that we're seeing significant interest from around the world. Now, this leads to the key thing. How do you build this enduring moat in your company? It comes down to the culture. So let's talk about these terms. Now, there's some nuances here, and you may not agree exactly with the terms that I'm going to use, but at least we have a foundation to think about. So, the AI first mindset, that phrase is traditionally being used by 20-year-old SaaS companies. In particular, Mark Benioff and Aaron Levy from Salesforce and Box, respectively, are the ones pushing that they want their companies to be AI first. Um, I think Klarna also did and Shopify, right? So it's traditional companies that are saying, we want to be AI first. We are tech companies. We're old tech companies, but now we want to use AI first. So what does AI first mean? It means that if you have a problem, business or personal, you first see if there's an AI available off the shelf or from the app store in this case. If not, then you build it. If you're not technical, no problem, use vibe coding. If you still can't complete it, then you hire a human to build it. That is the AI first mindset. That's the exact process that you are to follow. And that's what these traditional tech companies are trying to do. Now, if you go to a traditional company like Coke, Starbucks, um, a, a auto company, their workers are scared of, well, actually, in tech companies, workers are scared too. So they cannot use that term, or they often don't say AI first, so they use this euphemism called AI forward. 
This means the same shit, by the way. But it's basically, it sounds better, right? So AI forward is used by traditional uh, corporations. And then, of course, there's AI Bloodite, somebody who's resistant to AI. And I hear, I see it, and I understand why people are fearful of something new and something that's threatening as well. And there's a fourth type. Now, the interesting thing about this fourth type of culture is they don't say it. If you say this, you actually aren't it. Ready? AI natives. The AI natives, most of them are here in San Francisco. They do the AI first mindset. It's already built inside of what they do, but they don't need to say it. It's kind of like if you're awesome. You don't say you're awesome because then you're not awesome, right? So let's take a look at the data. This is a leaderboard uh, from, from Henry, and this is just such an awesome leaderboard. This is called the Lean AI uh, Leaderboard. So you can go to that website, and it lists around 40 companies that are these lean AI native companies. And here's the criteria to get on this leaderboard. It's absolutely bonkers, okay? So the company has to be under 50 employees, under five years old, and generating more than $5 million. Now, let me give you some stats. Like, what does an average company look like? Um, so the average tech SaaS company, like the old ones that are 20 years old, their average revenue per employee, right, 20-year-old tech company, average revenue per each employee is 200K. Hold that number in your head, ready? 200K, got it? 200K. Now, the top 10 SaaS traditional companies like Salesforce and Adobe, their average revenue per employee, you can look at the bottom down here, is 610K. 610K. So the average company is 200K. The top 10 are 610. Get ready. The AI native startups, their average revenue per employee is 3.4 million. Wow. We have never seen that level of scale. That's because they're using AI agents. That's because they're using AI foundation models. That's because they're AI natives. Everything is AI first. They have very few employees. They have 24 employees. The company is three years old. The average gross revenue is almost $100 million. We've never seen that in tech. This is the first time we have seen how a new set of technologies and the right culture together build something big. In fact, there's just a few startups that are just killing it. Mid-Journey, Eleven Labs, I'm not an investor in any of these, sadly, but they're making 500 mil, 100 mil, 100 mil, 75. Uh, and they're mostly here in San Francisco. This doesn't even include OpenAI, because they're even older, right? But their revenues are much higher valuations at like 600M, I heard. Okay, so I asked you this question, how do you build an enduring moat in this world? And I wanted to show you how to build this strategy, and it's actually a blueprint. And this is exactly what we're looking for in investing in AI startups, and I wanted to share it with you. So the culture is key. Uh, we just assume you already have that culture. It's not like I'm going to test you. Like, if you're an AI startup and you're not AI native, like, you're not going to make it. So I don't even have to look, gauge that one. But the first thing that we look for is, um, are you in the right market? And also, do you have proprietary data? I'll show you an example in just a second. A proprietary data set that you can train on or you have RAG access to or your agents have access to is a moat. Proprietary data is a moat. But don't forget, your competitors can create synthetic data to replicate your database, so it actually may not last that long. Uh-oh, right? So this is an issue. So the main things to look for are network effects. What's a network effect? A network effect is when every new user or client or customer, when they participate with your company, the value increases for all of them. Um, there's, I, met, I saw a lot of the startups yesterday. Like I saw your startup, which is event-based, right? Like, yeah, you, P-I-I, -I, right, P-A, yeah, you, Batty, that's right. So it's an event-based app, right, by location, right? So as more people participate, the value increases as everybody participates. That's a network effect. Um, you, you have data, a uh, financial data company. As you get more data and more people participate, your network value increases, right, Docker? So I, like many of you have these network effects. There are six different types, from data to direct to, um, 
um, and learning effects. AI has a learning effect, by the way. That learning effect, by the way, is table stakes. Like, we don't think that's a differentiator at all. Every AI startup has a learning effect. So the other uh, network effects, marketplaces, communities, social networks, exchanges, app platforms, um, those are also network effects to, to tap onto. Now, the third thing is called viral effects. A viral effect, it means your product grows with very little marketing, very little sales, very little advertising. In fact, when we're looking at a deal, we strip away that data and we say, it does your product grow on its own? And that's called product-led growth, right? Or you might have a partnership strategy, a channel partner is reselling your product for you or you're listed in an app exchange or you have top 10 stars on GitHub or Product Hunt. Those are also distribution channels. That is also good. It means you will spread. Now, if you do this, your company starts to blitz scale. It means you become the largest player within your market. And that's really your goal. And that's how you become enduring in the space. Just as an example, um, uh, uh, one of our startups is called Make It, and they have architectural diagrams and they enable all of these things to actually, uh, that's trained off the proprietary data. So to summarize, how are things accelerating? Uh, there's 40,000 AI projects as of last week, according to the database, there's an AI for that, .com of course. And we're in the era now where you as founders are going to compete with an AI agent that will be creating a competitive product. So the database, the founder can't tell if the startups are being created by AI. That's the world we're in now. So you really need to have a business strategy in place. Um, AI native cultures, we talked about how there's, one of our investments is in Crew AI, and Crew AI's enterprise agents, they are already in 60% of the Fortune 500. The company's only around 20 months old. That's really fast. They only have 30 employees, but 300 AI agents. So that ratio is one that I saw 10 agents per human worker as a way to grip their market as fast as possible, which is incredible. So you need to have that mindset in order to ship faster. Also having that proprietary data, most of the foundation models have already sucked up the public internet and soon Google will, is, you can see they're indexing all the YouTube content as well. So that is already a commodity. If your startup is built off public data, you're, that's not going to, you're not going to make it. So you need to find proprietary data or you build your own database with synthetic data. That's critical. You must have that. Network effects, again, this means that your business strategy, as every new customer joins, the value increases for all the other customers. This is critical part of your strategy. So for companies that are just selling like a B2B um, SaaS product that doesn't do that, you will have to have, you'll have to hire very expensive salespeople in order to sell your product. It just doesn't scale. And then lastly, having a viral effect means the product spreads on its own with low marketing, low sales, low advertising, or you have distribution partners. That is how you scale. And these are the ways to build an enduring moat in the era of an AI native company. I hope that was helpful. Um, I'm gonna make my slides available for you to grip. This is a QR code. It takes you to a Google form. You will stay in touch with me on my newsletter, and you'll also be able to download uh, my slide deck from here, and also my Agentic slide deck that I also give on keynotes. Thank you so much. All right, now we're gonna hear from the real experts beyond some blabbering VC on what we're gonna think about is this race, this arms race, between United States sovereignty of AI. Um, also, we heard the term American dynamism out of A16Z. And then also out of the rest of the world. Like, can America compete with China? And what I see at a high level is America has first a market with AI. We often have proprietary subscription-based AI services. But we're seeing that China is a rapid follower and they are offering open source, and they have control over the hardware stack, and America does not. What a battle. And then Europe, I know there's many Europeans here in the market, are kind of stuck in between, don't know what to do. Should we regulate, should we adopt? Who do we partner, east or west? I don't know. And then the rest of the world is still watching to see what to do. But we'll find out from the experts, and I wanted to welcome my close friend. <laughs>